Okay, so here's, here's an individual who's something major has just happened, which is set off like an alarm in their brain. Okay, so this siren is starting to ring, danger or get angry or whatever the trigger is. Okay, um, a few things happen now. Some nerve impulses go down and that'll start getting uh, increase in muscle tension. Okay, so now we're starting to get worked up already. And also we get a release of adrenaline from the adrenal gland. And all these things combine to cause an increase in heart rate, in some lungs, an increase in breathing rate is common. The other thing that happens is the, the airways from the adrenaline, the airways in the lungs open right up as well. So you get increased air entry um, and you probably get increased in what we call tidal volume. So you're moving a lot more air in and out of your lungs. And the other thing that's happening is with the increased heart rate is you're sending a river of blood to your lungs. So there's a lot more scope for oxygen coming in, which is really handy if you're running for your life, and a lot more scope for getting rid of the waste CO2 that your muscles would be producing if you're running for your life. So that's what's going on. Some people often feel sick in the guts or they might have a dry mouth. This, these are the other things that are happening. You might feel hot, you might feel sweaty, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the fight or flight response. And usually that's where the story ends for most people. The thing we need to understand is how does this cause us to feel emotionally overwhelmed? And this is the bit that's usually missing. So what I'm gonna do here, just imagine this is a little test tube here of some blood, okay? Blood's got some carbon dioxide dissolved in it. Even at rest, you, you sort of learn in school, oxygen comes in and carbon dioxide goes out. But we keep this sort of reservoir of carbon dioxide in our blood and it has this really important role in regulating the acidity of the blood. So the normal pH of the blood is somewhere between 7.35 and 7.45. Okie dokie. Fantastic, what do you do? What's that got to do with anything? Well, you remember when I told you we're sending a river of blood to our lungs, which are, are really good at exchanging gases, which is handy if we're running for our lives to get lots of oxygen. But if you're having a panic attack, chances are you're not actually running for your life. Chances are you're sitting there freaking out. So you've got tons of oxygen, that's not an issue. But the issue actually becomes, we get so good at get, getting rid of the CO2 from our blood, we breathe it all out. And we end up with this sort of situation here, where all the CO2 has been breathed out. Okay. And that has a, a major implication to the chemistry of the blood by changing the acidity. So now the, the pH of the blood might go up to 7.5 or 7.6 or 7.7. .7. These mightn't sound like big changes, but they really are from a chemistry point of view. So we have a situation now where the blood is becoming more and more alkaline. All right? And the medical term for this is respiratory alkalosis. All right? And basically, when your blood is like this, things don't work properly anymore. All right? So you might be familiar with the experience of blowing up a balloon, like for a kid's birthday party. And when you do that, if you do it too quick, what might you experience? A kind of lightheadedness. It's a really uncomfortable kind of feeling. And if you stop blowing up the balloons, after a minute or two, it goes away. Well, it's this kind of process that's going on in this sort of instance when we're having a panic attack too. But it's worse, it's way worse, okay? So we're having this profound effect. The blood that's making its way to the brain is the wrong acidity completely, okay? Essentially, you can't think straight in this instance. So if we go back to our original kind of paradigm here, there's an event that triggers an emotion. We get some physical symptoms, and then we feel overwhelmed, all right? Let's say the, the emotion was fear. The physical symptoms are what they are, okay? But when we get overwhelmed with that emotion, that's when we experience terror. So this is kind of critical to understanding what's going on in a panic attack. We are literally in a kind of delirious state with an exacerbation of the underlying emotion. Same goes for anger, obviously. In that case, we end up in rage. Okie dokie. So that's all very well in theory. The point of this is what can you do about it? What can you do about it? What we want to do is we want to get this CO2 somehow back in the blood safely, okay? Um, Conceivably, there's unsafe ways to do it, so we're gonna stick with safe ways, all right? There's, there's two ways that we can do that, okay? There's the, the quick and kind of dramatic way, or there's the slow and subtle way, all right? So if you're having a panic attack, you're sitting here, you're absolutely freaking out, you don't know what to do, you can terminate that panic attack in about 30 seconds, 
all right, if you apply this principle. And the principle is, your muscles are excellent at generating CO2 when they're moving. So if you were to start, say, running up a flight of stairs, that would very quickly generate some carbon dioxide, and that would be dissolved into your blood, and that would normalize the pH, okay, normalize the acidity of the blood. And what that would do is it would end this overwhelm. Yeah, sure, you might still be anxious, okay, you might still be fearful, you probably possibly will be, but the overwhelm is gone. So you're no longer freaking out, okay, or you're no longer feeling enraged. That's calmed down to just being angry. So this is a critical principle, and you don't need to do all that much activity. So whatever would make you huff, if you were at rest, not panicking, just at rest, and you were to run up and down some stairs, what would it take to get you huffing and puffing? The huffing and puffing is actually from the carbon dioxide trying to be degassed. So whatever that amount would be, that might be a couple of flights of stairs, well, that's the amount of activity that you need to end the panic attack. Happens super fast, okay? So I've seen it clinically. I do this with patients when necessary. And you can turn that into a panic attack in under a minute doing this, all right? A lot of people with panic will sit there for 40 minutes freaking out, okay? So this is an absolute godsend to them. Now, that's all very well in, in some situations, but it's not exactly always convenient to just run up and down some stairs when you're starting to panic. It'd be nicer to be able to do something a bit more subtle, potentially. Um, so the other thing that we can do to reaccumulate some CO2 in here safely is basically to slow the breathing rate down, okay? This will have the same effect. Because even though um, you're still sending a river of blood to your lungs, if you lower the breathing rate, you don't have to worry about exchanging so much gas and getting rid of all this CO2. We're sort of holding on to the CO2. Now, you can't just hold your breath because you still need some oxygen, right? But what you can do is slow the breathing rate right down. Now, a lot of people get taught to do deep breathing, like a massive breath in, really deep, and then out. The problem with that, in my mind, is you just accentuating this issue potentially, all right? The, the critical thing is actually slowing the breathing rate down. Um, now, it doesn't really matter how you do it. There's, there's, you know, 30 different ways to do it. But one way that kind of is, is relatively simple that works is to use some sort of timer to time your breathing, all right? So I'll just do a little graph here. So the normal breathing rate of someone when they're, you know, not anxious, just chilling out, okay? is something like 12 breaths per minute. And it's a fairly shallow breath in with a little pause, a fairly shallow breath out with a little pause. When someone is freaking out with anxiety, the breathing rate can go right up. So you end up with these sort of deep, rapid breaths. And some people, when they do that, they, you might have seen this, some people are sort of gaspers where they're <gasps> when they're freaking out, and other people are sort of more panters. <laughs> Either way, the breathing rate is fast and there's a lot of volume, okay? So if you compare the at rest to this other graph that I've drawn over the top, you can see where I'm colouring in. That's essentially the difference between those two breaths, and that is just CO2 leaving the body. So it takes no time, okay? It takes, you know, 10 seconds, okay, of hyperventilation with a high heart rate and an open airway for this change to start to manifest, okay? Once it starts, it kind of gets a bit of a life of its own and it accelerates, and before you know it, you're in the throes of a full-on panic attack. So we said we want to slow it down. So how, how do we want to slow it down? Well, essentially what we want to do is, I think, forget about the deep breathing, okay? We want to take a kind of shallowish kind of breath in. Okay, maybe, maybe a little bit deeper than normal, but nothing major, something like this. That's it. Then you look at your handy watch, you look at your second hand, and you wait 10 seconds with that breath in. And after 10 seconds elapses, you breathe out. Okay, you breathe in again. And then you pause again for another 10 seconds. Okay, and so on. Out, in, pause for 10 seconds. What that does, this 10 second pause, tends to take about five seconds to cycle the breath. So that takes 15 seconds. So that slows your breathing rate down to about four breaths per minute. So that's really, really slow, okay? Now you must use a timer. If you try and count 10 seconds when you're panicking, you don't count slowly, right? You count really quickly, so you end up defeating the purpose. So you definitely need some sort of way of objectively knowing the time has elapsed. 
you want to practice the hell out of this when you're calm because just trying to do this off the bat when you're freaking out is not the time to all of a sudden try and learn a new skill, okay? So you want to practice this as often as you can when you're calm so you can deploy this activity when you're panicking. All right, so 15 second breath duration. You want to repeat this for a total of two minutes. So that's eight breaths, okay? Maybe up to three minutes. I wouldn't go much longer than that. If, if you don't feel it's quite worked, you can do it, have a little pause and then do it again. We do still want to have the breath coming in and out because you do need the oxygen, okay? No point just holding your breath for two minutes to reaccumulate carbon dioxide because if your oxygen gets low, that's not gonna improve your mental state at all. Alrighty, so that is in a nutshell, the physiology of the panic response. Event, emotion, the physical symptoms are necessary, like we talked about here, to cause the emotional overwhelm, okay? Now that we're overwhelmed, what's happened is we've depleted the CO2 in our blood. So where blood's at the wrong acidity, we've got to put the CO2 back. There's two ways. Do some vigorous physical activity. That's the quick way, not always convenient. The other way is slow our breathing rate right down, but that requires practice. So that's it, guys. Thanks a lot.